much. Would you take God's word, please? Open to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 26 is what we're going to be looking at, and I want to read a few verses here. Would you stand for the reading of God's word, Genesis chapter 26, and we'll look at just a few verses here in our reading, starting at verse 1. And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. May God help us as we go to the scripture today. Give us understanding and enlightenment. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for this very special day. And Lord, help me to preach the word clearly and help us to apply truth to life that we may be blessed in our doing and you may be honored. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> no doubt you've heard the expression, the proverb, like father, like son. We call this a, a, a modern-day English proverb. A proverb is normally a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an observation of human nature. It's not a steadfast promise. It's not something that's unmovable. It's something that's generally true. And it's a little bit of concise wisdom put in a little expression of something that is normally true. And it's normally true, this idea of like father, like son. That is to say that in some way, in some manner, the son will show um, the father. In other words, he may talk like his father, he may walk like his father, he may look like his father in some measure, or act like his father, and so on. And we would all agree that that is a, a statement that is generally true. But we see this, this proverb really illustrated tremendously here in Genesis chapter 26. This is a story about the life of Isaac. And Isaac is one of those characters in the Old Testament that doesn't get a lot of airtime, we could say. There's not a lot written about Isaac. There's a lot written about Abraham. There's a lot written about Jacob, a lot written about Joseph. But if you look at the Genesis narrative, there's really only one chapter that looks at the life of Isaac, and that's the chapter we're going to look at here in chapter number 26. And there's really nothing big that stands out about him other than this, that he followed in the footsteps of his father. He did a lot of things that his father did. In fact, if you look at Isaac in chapter 26, what you really see is a summary of the life of Abraham. There's such a parallel there. And the writer points this out on purpose. Now remember, who's the writer of Genesis? The writer is Moses. And who is he writing to? He's writing to the children of Israel that had just come out of Egypt. They were crossing into the promised land. Moses wrote Genesis to give the people of Israel a sense of identity, who they were. They were he was writing about God's promise, about what God was going to do for them, and so that they might trust the Lord. And so, why is he writing this story about Isaac here? Well, he wants to show that the promises that God made to Abraham were now going to be passed down to Isaac. In fact, in a very new way, Isaac is the new Abraham. Abraham died, but the promises that God gave to Abraham did not die. The things that God said he was going to do through Abraham, that's going to continue on. And the writer wants to show Israel this. That's what it meant to Israel and the readers back then. What does it mean to us today? Well, really, it's a story for fathers and their children. Again, when you read chapter 26, you get the feeling that you're reading the life of Abraham in summary form. Isaac will walk down the same path that Abraham walked down. He'll make some of the same decisions that Abraham made. He'll make some of the same failures that Abraham made. And what is the message to us today? It, to fathers, it says this, whatever you do is going to have an impact on your children. Remember that there are eyes that are watching you, and the way that you live your life today will make an impact on your children and so really what we see here in this story are reasons why we as fathers must live a godly life, why we must be an example to those little feet that will be following us. So what I want you to see from this story are six reasons for fathers to set a godly example for their children. I want us to see this here in the text of Genesis 26. And here's the first reason, number one, children will endure the same famine as their father. Our children are going to go through the same trials that we go through. 
Just as Abraham experienced a famine in the promised land, even so Isaac will experience a famine in the promised land. Look in verse number one. And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Just like there was a famine in the days of Abraham, now many years removed from that, now there is a famine in the days of Isaac. You might remember the story of Abraham. God said, Abraham, leave your father, leave your family, go down into the land of Canaan. I watch over you there. I'll take care of you there. Abraham obeys God. He goes down into the land of Canaan. And what's the first thing that happens when he gets there? A famine hits. (laughs) What is he going to do now? Well, he has to make a decision. Either he will trust what God says or he'll resort to his own devices. Well, you know what Abraham did. He went down to Egypt because that's what people did back then. And Abraham was early in his spiritual journey. And so he took matters into his own hand. He was still learning to live by faith. But in this area, he failed. And now here's another famine. Years later, here's Isaac. And now Isaac is facing the same thing. He's in the land of Canaan and a famine hits. What's Isaac going to do? Well, you know what? Isaac is pretty much going to do the same thing that Abraham did. But let me, let, here's one lesson we can learn from all of this. Trials are a normal part of life. You know what, dads? We need to teach that to our children. Just because you are in the right place where you're supposed to be doesn't mean everything's going to go right. We have this mistaken idea in the Christian life. If I go where God tells me to go and stay where he tells me to stay, that everything's going to be great. It'll be all milk and honey in the land of Canaan. No, that's not true. That's not reality. The reality is we will go through trials. We'll go through difficulty. We're going to go through famines. And fathers, just remember this, when you go through a trial, you go through a difficulty, you go through a famine, remember there are those watching you and seeing how you handle that. They're watching to see what you will do in this time. Our sovereign God always uses trials with his servants. God has a purpose in all those trials. He's teaching us to depend upon him and him alone. And when we go through that trial and we trust God, our faith grows. But it's a normal part of the Christian life. Pick up some Christian biographies. Read about the great people God has used. And the common denominator you will find is that they were people that went through famine. They went through trials. So this is why we need to be careful. We need to be careful in the message that we give. We need to leave a legacy of trusting God even in the famine. One little girl said to her dad as she was following him on the top of the clumps of freshly laid grass, she said, Dad, if you don't get your feet muddy, I won't get my feet muddy. Good message in that. But here's number two. Another reason we must live a godly life and be an example, children must exercise the same faith as their father. Our children have to learn to exercise faith. Now, look in verse number two. And the Lord appeared unto him, that is, he appeared unto Isaac, and said, go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land, which I shall tell thee of. Just as the Lord appeared to Abraham, now he will appear to Isaac. And God appears to Isaac and says, Isaac, don't go down to Egypt, but rather stay in the promised land and learn to trust me. I know as Father, you have this desire. I want the same God that has spoken his word to me, I want him to speak that word to my children. I want my children to learn to hear from God. And here God comes and he speaks to Isaac just like he did to Abraham. God appeared to Abraham on eight occasions. This is the first time he appears to Isaac. And again, he reiterates the promise that he gave to Abraham. Just like I said to Abraham, if you stay here and you trust me, I will take care of you. The same word of God that God gives us as fathers, he will give to our children. The same promises must be claimed. So God makes the same promises here. Look in verse number three. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee and unto thee and to thy thy seed. I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy Father, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So God reminds Isaac that Abraham obeyed. He kept my voice, my charges, my commandments. And here God is saying, Isaac, be like your father Abraham. He learned to obey me. He didn't do it perfectly. I'll grant you that. No man is perfect. 
but in the whole pattern of his life, in the overall of Abraham's life, he learned to put his trust in God. He learned to obey God's voice. And now God says, Isaac, you need to learn the same lesson. Fathers, we need to learn to obey the Lord so that we can teach our children to do the same because they will come after us. They will follow us. And so the message is to Isaac is very simple. Don't go down to Egypt. Don't go down there. Stay in the land. Now, someone here might be thinking, what's so bad about Egypt? Well, Egypt was the standard refuge in that day. When there was a famine, normally people would go to Egypt. Egypt that was there, situated along the, the Nile, was a very fertile plain. And at the overflowing of the Nile, it would, it would nourish the land, and there was always crops there. And so when a, a, a famine would hit, people from all over would go down into Egypt. That was the natural thing to do. That was the logical thing to do. That seemed to be the right thing to do. But let me remind you, as children of God, God... Children are not always called to do the natural thing. God might call us to do something different as a testimony to the world. We need to learn to trust the Lord to show others. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Everyone goes to Egypt for help. Doesn't mean that's what you're supposed to do. God doesn't want us doing what everyone else does. He wants us doing what he commands us to do, what he tells us to do. On a few occasions, people of God going down to Egypt made God angry because it showed they were trusting more in Egypt than they were trusting in him. Listen to Isaiah 31.1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they're many and in the horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. God pronounced a woe upon those that run to Egypt for refuge and depend upon the strength of the military, the strength of the horses, instead of depending upon the Lord. This was the message that God wanted to teach Abraham. This is the message that God wanted to teach Isaac. This is the message that God wants to teach us. Put our full faith in the Lord. Uh, so Isaac, that's what he's going to do. He's following his father's footsteps. He's going down to Egypt. That's what Abraham did. He doesn't pray about it. It's a natural reflex. It's the logical thing to do. And sometimes we're just like Isaac when a trial comes. Rather than seek the Lord, we kind of go into survival mode. We kind of say, okay, here's the right, here's the logical thing. The first thing we need to do is to seek God. And ask what God would have us to do. Egypt, as a sense, is a type of the world. God doesn't want his people going to the world for help instead of trusting him. Now, to Isaac's credit, he stops in his tracks. Look in verse number 6. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Here we applaud Isaac because he heard what God said. And to his, to his credit, he stops right where he is. He doesn't go any farther and he decides to dwell there in Gerar. The word dwell, yasha, means to settle. He settles down there. And here is a token of his faith in God. And so like Abraham, Isaac is learning to trust in the Lord. Oh, that my children would learn to trust in the Lord. That's the prayer of every father. Oh, that my children would learn to fully trust in the Lord. And so our children must endure the same famine they must learn to exercise the same faith. But here's a third reason why we need to set a godly example. Children will entertain the same fears as their father. They're going to have to entertain the same fears. Look down at verse number 7. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say she is my wife, lest, uh, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah because she was fair to look upon once Isaac got to Gerar. Uh, he, there were some men that wasn't a very godly place. There were some men that began to ask about his wife. He was afraid that if he said that this was my wife, that they would kill him and take his wife because she was a beautiful woman. So the, in order to protect himself, he says, she is my sister. That's a very creative lie there. She's my sister. And, and later this lie was found out, by the way, in verse 8, it came to pass that when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. King Abimelech is looking out of the window, and he sees her sporting. That's the word that's used there. 
It could mean caressing. Um, the Hebrew word is very unique. Whatever it has, it, whatever it was, it's kind of hard to define specifically what it was, but whatever it was, it's something that you don't do with your sister. Because by doing this, by seeing this, the king knew this is not his sister. This is his wife. And he's called out on this lie that he gives. Where did Isaac learn to make such a creative lie? Go back to Genesis chapter 20 real quick and look in this story here. Here's Abraham many years earlier in Genesis chapter 20, verse number 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Sound familiar? Same place, same location. In verse 2, and Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now, this is not the same Abimelech, surely. Abimelech is not necessarily the name of a man. It's more of a title. Abi is the Hebrew for my father. Melech is the Hebrew for king. My father is king. But I think it's referring to a title of a man who held the position of ruler of the Philistine people at that time, Abimelech. And here the king of the Philistines, he also sees Sarah. She's beautiful. He desires her. Abraham says, oh, she's my sister. Wow, same lie. In verse 3, and God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Behold, thou art but a dead man. You don't ever want to have that dream when God says you're a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she even herself said, he is my brother. And the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou hast done this in the integrity of thine heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against her. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore this man his wife, for he is a prophet. And so here in this story, uh, Abimelech pleads innocence, ignorance. Look, this is what he told me. And Abraham, rather than choosing to trust God, tells this lie to protect himself out of fear. You see, when fear comes, how we respond to those fears tells a lot about our spiritual condition. Abraham chose a lie. Now, God had said to Abraham, Abraham, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation out of you and Sarah. How's that going to happen if Abraham is dead? He should have trusted in God's word. He should have said, you know what? I don't need to be afraid. God will protect me. God made me some promises. I trust in the promises of God. Rather than doing that, he resorted again to his own schemes. And now fast forward many years later, here is Isaac, and he is doing the same thing. Children will sometimes repeat the sins of their fathers. If you don't want your children to follow a sinful pattern, Dad, then you stop doing it. Don't do it. Teach them how to gain victory over sin. Teach them how to gain victory over fears. Fears are very real, but we need to be like the psalmist at what time I am afraid. I will trust in the Lord. I will learn to trust in God. And when we learn to do that, you know what? There will be those that follow in that. And they'll learn also, rather than to capitulate to their fears, they will put their trust in the Lord. That's why we have to be an example. Our children have to endure the same famines. They must exercise the same faith. They will entertain the same fears that we entertain. But here's a fourth thing. Children can enjoy the same favor as their father. They can enjoy the same favor. Go back to 20, chapter 26 and look at verse number 12. And then Isaac sowed in that land... And received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now, just as God blessed Abraham for his faith and obedience, now here is God blessing Isaac for his faith and his obedience. God just opens the windows of heaven on Isaac. Isn't that wonderful? Here he is obeying the Lord. Here he is trusting in the Lord, following the footsteps of Abraham. And here is God opening up those windows of blessing on him. That is the desire of every father for their children, is it not, fathers? We want God to bless our children. We want God to open up the windows of heaven on our children. And we see it here in the harvest in verses 12 and 13. He has a big harvest, a hundredfold harvest 
That's, that's huge. That would be a good harvest in any land. But to have it in, the, in a barren land, and remember, this is in the middle of a famine. Did you know that God's children can be blessed in the middle of a famine? When, when it's famine all else around, God can bless his obedient children even in the midst of that. And this is what we see here with Isaac. I can just imagine the farmers out there saying, how do you get such a big harvest? I mean, there was no miracle grow back in those days. And Isaac would say, well, the Lord told me just not to go to Egypt, but to stay here and to trust in him, and I'm trusting in the Lord, and what he's doing is wonderful. Not only the harvest, but also the herds. In verse number 14, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. His flocks and his herds increased. That's how one measured their wealth in, those, in that barter economy in those days. You measured your wealth by the, the number that you had in your, in your herds and in your flocks of sheep. And it's very evident that the hand of God is now on Isaac. Another sign of that is the hostility because hostility comes. Look at verse 15. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. They were so jealous about what was going on with Isaac that they were trying to drive him out of the land. And by the way they did that was they filled in his wells. I mean, they took away his water supply. You can't have good crops and you can't have herds. Uh, healthy herds if you don't have water. And so they were trying to actually drive him out of town. In fact, King Gerar said, you know, you're mightier than we are. You just need to leave. But the point is, is that just as God blessed Abraham for his obedience, God blessed Isaac. We had a tendency sometimes to think that our fathers that have gone on before us, man, their, their life was so fully blessed. And boy, they were just on a different level. And, and I'm not really sure I can have what they had. Let me just tell you, you can. We can be blessed as our forefathers were if we live by the same faith and exercise the same obedience and trust in the Lord the same way, God can bless us just as much. Now, here's a fifth thing that we learned. You see, we have to set a godly example because our children, they're going to be watching and they will endure the same famines. They have to exercise the same faith. They will entertain the same fears and they can enjoy the same favor from God as us. But here's number five. Children will encounter the same fight as their father. Because what we see now is that Isaac now is in a conflict. He's trying to, they're trying to drive him out of the land. It was through no fault of his own. All he has done has been obedient. He's tried to do the right thing before God, but now it's raised hostility, and they're trying to drive him out of the land. Look at verse 17. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tents in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. Uh, and by the way, this is what Isaac is most noted for here in this chapter. You know what he is? He's a well digger. He just keeps digging wells. But that's a good thing because what it reflects is his determination to stay there in that land and trust God the way God said. And here's the enemy trying to drive him out. Probably, again, the most natural thing he could do is say, you know what, I tried, but I'm just going to go ahead down to Egypt now because now I have all these enemies against me. And that would be a safe option for him, but he doesn't do that. No. He just moves a little bit farther and gets out of the conflict and he digs another well and he's going to stay there. Again, we have to commend Isaac for this because he's trying to obey God. He's trying to balance the two. He's trying to live peaceably with all the people around him and he's also trying to obey the Lord. So he doesn't totally leave Gerar. He just moves a little east. He redigs the wells that his fathers had dug in the land of the Philistines and he has to fight for those wells. And here's one fight at the well of Esek. Look at verse 20. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek because they strove with him. Esek is, really means quarrel. I call this the well of argument. Isaac is now at the well of argument there. But he doesn't want to, again, he doesn't want the conflict. He wants to try to live peaceably. You know, you ever notice that some people just like to argue? They just like strife. They just want to always be, you know, in some kind of conflict. Isaac is a peaceable person. And so what he does is he just moves a little farther east. He goes to another well. Look at verse 21. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna, 
which is the Hebrew word, which means accusation or opposition. I call this the well of accusation. He had a well there at Isaac, that's the well of argument. He says, I'm not going to stay here for too much conflict. He moves a little east, and then he digs the well, and this is the well of accusation. Now, they're making accusations against Isaac. You stole this well from us. We had this well here. It was ours. We were here before you. You're a foreigner. You're in our land. Get out. And again, Isaac didn't want to leave the land because God told him to stay. And God was blessing him where he was, even though there was a famine in the land. God was still blessing him. So he just moved a little farther east, and he digs another well. And again, digging wells to me is the determination of Isaac to obey the Lord. So he goes to verse 22, another well, and from he removed from thence, and he digged another well. For that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. The word Rehoboth means wide spaces or enlargement. He dug this well. I call this the well of abundance. He dug this well, and finally there was no contention. And Isaac says, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we'll be fruitful. This is the way I want to live, right? And you, I want to live where it's fruitful, where there's no strife and there's no contention. There's only a bright future. All of us would like to find our Rehoboth. I'm not talking about Rehoboth Beach either, okay? But we all would like to find our Rehoboth enlargement where we have plenty of room and there's no contention. Isaac found it, but he only found it after strife and trials and testing. Sometimes we have to go to those, through those things. We have to go to the well of argument and the well of accusation before we'll find the well of abundance in our life. And, and by the way, looking at this from a, another viewpoint, we can learn some spiritual lessons here. In, in, in the Bible, wells were a symbol of the blessing of the Lord. You know what, the church today keeps looking for new, something new, new ways to do things. But you know what we need to do is we need to redig the old wells that our fathers have dug. We need to get back to the old wells. There's no new way to do church. There's no new way. I've been doing a a series here on Sunday morning on spiritual disciplines, talking about the things that we need to get back to doing. You know what I'm asking you to do? Just redig those old wells. Worship and prayer and the word of God and confession and unity and love and all these things, being a part of the church, the body of Christ, being faithful. All these things are the old wells that we need to dig. We need to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to redig that well. Wherever there's been revival of spiritual power in the history of the church, it's because someone has gone back and redug that old well. We need to get back to it, back to the old wells. Now, let me give you the last thing here. We need to be examples as fathers, because our children will have to endure the same famine. They will have to learn to exercise the same faith. They will entertain the same fears. They can enjoy the same favor. They will encounter the same fights that we encounter. But here's the last thing. Children can experience the same fellowship as their father. Because look what happens. Look down at verse 23. And he went up thence from Beersheba. Now watch this in verse 24. And the Lord appeared unto him, the same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And look at verse 25. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. (laughs) I love this. Isaac, he had a lot of hassles on his journey. But God was using all of this. Actually, every time he would dig a new well, he was getting more into the promised land. They weren't driving him out. They were actually driving him in. He was getting closer and closer until finally he got him to the place where God wanted him, there at Beersheba, where Abraham had one time been. And then just as God appeared to Abraham, God now appears to Isaac there. God had to take him through all of that to get him to this one spot. And there he appears to Isaac. And Isaac experiences fellowship with God. Notice the promise God said to Isaac, Fear not, I am with you. I'm with you. Same thing God said to Abraham. Now he says it to Isaac, I'm with you. And you know what we've never seen Isaac do up until this point, up until verse number 25? 
We have never seen him do this. Now, we see Abraham do this a lot. You know what it is? It's build an altar. Everywhere Abraham went throughout the promised land, the Bible says he would build an altar that was almost like claiming this spot for God and calling upon the name of his God there at that spot. We never see Isaac do it until right now. This is the first time the well digger builds an altar. In verse 25, and he built it an altar and called upon the name of of the Lord. You know what happens here? He worships God. Now the God of his father becomes his God. Now he's my God. He's not just the God of my father. There comes a point in time when children must make their father's God their God. It has to be personal with you. You can't worship for your children. They have to do it themselves. Your God must become their God as the old saying goes, there are no, God has no grandchildren. And I think this is the point. God was no longer just the God of Abraham. Now he's the God of Abraham and Isaac. Now he's the God of Isaac. One writer writes this, Abraham's sanctuary at Beersheba becomes Isaac. And then notice also he digs a well there. <laughs> Not only does he build an altar, now he digs another well. Why? What's he saying? I'm staying right here. Staying right here. And again, this this episode is a mirror of what took place in the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 21. And you notice what else happens is that God now gives him peace with his enemies in verse 26 to 29. We don't have time to develop all of this. but, But Abimelech now sees the hand of God upon Isaac. And now he comes to Isaac, and they, he wants peace. And, and Isaac basically says, hey, you know, you've been fighting with me all this time. Why all of a sudden do you want to come to me and you want to make peace? And basically Abimelech says, well, because I can see that the hand of God is on your life. And we want to be at peace with you. And so they come to settle matters of property rights. They reach an agreement. Isaac throws a feast for his new friends. Look at verse 30. And he made a feast, and they did eat and drink. And later that same day, Isaac's service found water again, so they dig yet another well. Again, this was one of Abraham's wells, probably the same one that he dug in chapter 21. And Isaac names this well, the well of uh, Sheba, which means oath or seven. Um, Look in verse 33, and he called it Sheba, therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. And so there's blessing in his life to call it the well of covenant. But here's the major lesson. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless me just like he blessed Abraham. And the blessings that God has for us, God wants to bless our children in the same way. But what we have to do is we have to learn to obey God and walk by faith and be a godly example because we have eyes that are watching us so that they will learn to walk the same path that we walk. And they will learn to experience the same blessings that we experience in our life. That's God's, I believe, God's will for fathers and for sons. Like father, like son. This should, all of us, cause us to examine our own life. And by the way, let me just close by saying this. The greatest thing you can do, Dad, is to point your children to Jesus Christ and pray for their soul salvation, and be an example of obedience to Christ. Let them see that in your life. The greatest thing my father ever did for me was to show me the power of the gospel in his life. I saw him obey the gospel. I saw the power of God change his life. That I've never forgotten and never will. That's the greatest blessing he ever gave me. And not only that, but to love the word of God and want to obey the word of God. That's the greatest legacy that we can pass on to our children. May God help us in that. Let's let's bow for prayer together. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I would just ask you to examine your heart, please, before God. First fathers, well, how does this speak to you? What does it say to you today? I don't know about you, but it says to me, I have to remember 
There are others that are going to follow me. I have to learn to live by faith and trust God. I have to learn to teach my children how to deal with fears, exercise their faith. I have to teach them how to be faithful even in the midst of the fight, to trust in the Lord. Because I want my children to experience the same fellowship and blessing. And then to children, would you examine your heart and would you ask yourself, am I following in the footsteps that have been laid out before me, the footsteps of faith? I know that my father is not perfect. Abraham wasn't. But you know, he learned to obey the voice of the Lord. And his faith grew to the point to where he staggered not at the promises of God. And he trusted the Lord. Are you willing to follow in those steps of faith? If you're here and you're a child, I would say examine your heart. Make sure that you're trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone. Make sure you're trusting in his finished work on the cross. Your father's God has to become your God. Your parents can't live it for you. It's got to be your God. Is that true in your life? If not, right now, right where you are, would you spiritually build an altar right where you are? Spiritually, right where you are, build an altar and call upon the name of the Lord. And say, God of my Father, I want you to be my God not just the God of my Father. Be my God. Father, again, we thank you that you are the perfect Heavenly Father. Thank you for loving us with a perfect love and modeling for us that, that perfect love and grace. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to trust in you. And may those that follow also follow those footsteps of faith. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name.